Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Matthew Kronborg, National Executive Director of the United Nations Association of Australia, and I'll be your MC today. Welcome. Uh, before formal proceedings begin, I'm going to run through just a few housekeeping procedures to make sure that you can get the most out of the, uh, the two-day conference we have before you. Uh, firstly, mobile phones. We are in a theatre-style environment, so I'd appreciate if you're able to switch your mobile phones on silent. Uh, bathrooms are located uh, just outside uh, past the conference reception on the left-hand side. Catering and dietary requirements, morning tea, lunch and afternoon tea will be provided. If you have any special dietary requirements, please uh, let the re registration desk uh, know and they will work with venue catering staff to ensure you're accommodated. Uh, please refrain from bringing food and drink into the, uh, the theatre here itself. Uh, Evacuation procedures in the unlikely event uh, of fire are the reason requiring us to evacuate. Uh, there is an exit uh, out through here, one out the back and one out through the, uh, the conference registration area. Um, Governor General's reception. For those uh, VIPs who have received an invitation to the Governor General's reception uh, this evening, you'll need to bring your entree card with you and an official form of identification to gain entry unless otherwise specified. Uh, these guests are welcome to drive themselves. Uh, however, a 50-seat charter bus will be available uh, with priority given to our international uh, guest speakers. The rest of the seats will be available on a first-in, best-dressed basis. Uh, this bus will depart outside the memorial in front of the Poppies Cafe uh, at 5 p.m. sharp. Please assemble at this bus stop approximately 10 minutes early. After the reception, this bus will transport speakers back to their hotel in Barton. If Barton is useful to other delegates, they are welcome to join the return journey. Otherwise, taxis can be ordered at Government House. Uh, Wi-Fi, complimentary Wi-Fi is available in the theatre. Simply open the Australian War Memorial page and provide a personal email address to gain entry. Uh, photography, the use of photography in this theatre is fine. Uh, please avoid using a flash. If you wish to film any sessions, please move to the, uh, the back or the side of the room to avoid interrupting the view of those around you. Uh, Q&A. Many of the sessions will involve a Q&A component uh, to allow for you to engage in meaningful conversation and discussions. We encourage you to, uh, to participate. Please raise your hand if you would like to ask a question and you will be handed a microphone by one of our fantastic volunteers. Uh, in consideration of time, please keep your questions succinct. Uh, students. We have scholarshiped uh, a number of tickets to students for this conference. Uh, for young people that are interested in or presently studying in the, uh, the field. Uh, esteemed conference speaker Heidi Wilmot started her career as a UN intern and has offered to provide career advice to any interested students and younger people during the lunch break tomorrow. Uh, she will do so informally here at the front of the theatre. Uh, program changes. We have had to make a couple of uh, program changes over the past few days since going to print on the handbook. Uh, for instance, UNAA Sustainable Development Goals Goodwill Ambassador Dr Lynn Arnold AO uh, is unwell and sends his apologies from Adelaide. Uh, the session he was due to chair with the Australian Foreign Minister will instead be chaired by UNAA, UNAA National President Major General Michael G Smith AO retired. Uh, rapporteuring. This conference will be rapporteured with final report sent to all delegates. Social media. We will be live tweeting much of this conference. Uh, in addition to being present in the room, you are encouraged to join in the online conversation uh, by following our handle at UNAA underscore national, all lowercase, and using the hashtag UNAA2017. In case you missed those details, they are in the handbook uh, or visit the team at the reception desk. That concludes conference housekeeping. To begin proceedings, I now invite Auntie Agnes Scheer to, to the stage, Indigenous Elder upon the land who's, who which we meet, uh, to welcome us to country. Well, good morning, everybody. How are we all on one of Canberra's lovely fresh mornings? I'm very proud and honoured to be invited here today for this very special event. And uh, I'm filling in for another lady who is not very, very well. I'd um, like to start off by uh, acknowledging our distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. And I'd like to uh, welcome any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island friends who may have joined us 
and I extend that welcome to anyone who's uh, joining us today for the first time and those who've been here before, welcome back. Um, the Ngunnawal community are the traditional custodians of Canberra and the region. The audience may not be aware that the Ngunnawal nation is made up of several family groups and not just individuals who represent the interest of this country. Therefore, as a community, we have an elected body known as the United Ngunnawal Elders Council to represent us, along with the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island elected body of the ACT. This is important for you to understand and acknowledge, for our identity is a collective identity. There are other Indigenous and non-Indigenous people for many nations around the country and the world who have come to live on Ngunnawal land and I would like to acknowledge and pay my respects to them also and a very special welcome to them. Now I'll explain why an elder is asked to come and do welcome and the meaning of it. The tradition of welcoming people to country is a practice and that was handed down by our ancestors, our old people and elders from the beginning of time. And what it means before entering another person's country, you would always announce your arrival and not enter until a traditional owner of that country welcomed you. And the reason for this practice is to protect your spirit while you're in another person's country, but also show respect to the people of the country you're entering. And as one of the Ngunnawal elders, I'm always very proud when non-Indigenous organisations and government do ask an elder to come and do welcome to country, it shows that they are also respecting our traditional culture and it helps to build the reconciliation and bring respect between many cultures of people who now live in the ACT and region but also throughout Australia. The Ngunnawal people, as with all Aboriginal people, have a great heritage that we would like to share with all Australians from every walks of life. And as you are aware, Canberra means meeting place. And Canberra has been a place of gathering for many Aboriginal tribes of Australia to come together to deal with important businesses, such as the one that's happening here, and also for ceremonial occasions. Our ancestors believed in the importance of people gathering together for the purpose of building relationships, sharing knowledge, and to celebrate the gift of heritage and history. We believe it's important for all to recognize our new unique histories and to gain understanding that our land is our heritage and how the loss of land has disconnected many Aboriginal peoples from their spiritual links, cultural heritage and identity. So on behalf of the Ngunnawal community and the other elders and myself, I would like to thank you all again. And for those who may have traveled for the, here for this event, when it's time for you to travel back home to your own countries, I wish you all a very safe and enjoyable journey. And now I'll finish in the language of the Ngunnawal people, Nagana Yarabai Yangu, which means you're welcome to leave your footprints on our land now, or in other words, welcome to Ngunnawal country. Thank you. Please enjoy the rest of the event. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Well, good morning, everybody, and a warm welcome. My name's Michael Smith, and I'm the uh, National President of the UNAA. I acknowledge the traditional owners on the land in which we meet, the Ngunnawal people, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. And I particularly want to thank Auntie Agnes for her very warm welcome to country. Parliamentarians, members of the diplomatic corps, special guests from afar, UNAA members, our very kind sponsors, our many volunteers, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the UNAA National Conference 2017. Many distinguished people will be coming and going throughout the next two days. So at the moment, let me just make special mention of three people, one of whom is the Ambassador for Timor-Leste. Very good to have you here, uh, Abel, and uh, thank you so much for everything that you've been doing. And uh, His Excellency Marty Natalagawa is also with us this morning and he will be speaking to us this morning and it's so, so great to have you here, two of our closest countries. And my counterpart from New Zealand, Joy Dunsheath, the President of the New Zealand uh, United Nations Association. Joy, it's just wonderful to have you here and I feel very guilty that I have not yet uh, joined you uh, in New Zealand. This conference comes on the eve of the second, 72nd General Assembly in New York. With a new Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, with a GA agenda focused on peace and security and much needed UN reform. And with most of the world's leaders and or their high level representatives in attendance. The GA also comes at a time when global security is more problematic and uncertain than at any time since the UN was created from the ashes of World War II, built as it was on the bodies of more than 60 million people. In the current multipolar and disrupted world, I doubt that we could write and agree a UN charter or a universal declaration of human rights as good as the ones we already have. Of course, geopolitical circumstances have changed enormously since the United Nations was established, but the principles for which the organisation stands are no less relevant today. We live in very challenging and uncertain times. If the rules-based international order is to survive, then the United Nations will be required more than ever. But the United Nations is the collective product of all member states and of their civil societies. Cynics often claim that the GA is nothing more than a diplomatic talk fest. But those who follow and understand the UN know that important decisions are shaped during the GA and particularly during the many side events and consultations that occur. Of course, this conference that we're attending will not shape those outcomes, but it will help us to become more aware of the many and key issues relevant to the peace and security agenda and how Australia can contribute. Yesterday, the Australian Peacekeeping Memorial was dedicated on Anzac Parade. It was a very moving ceremony. The memorial is a beautiful monument that testifies to the significant contribution that Australian military, police and civilians have made to peace operations over the past 70 years. I would like to congratulate Major Tim, General Tim Ford and the members of his hard-working memorial committee for making this dream a reality. 12 long years of hard work. And I'm so pleased that the UNAA was a member of that committee 
during that period. For those who could not be there yesterday, I encourage you to visit the site. This conference also honours the enormous contribution of the many Australian military, police and civilians over, who have committed their service over 70 years of peacekeeping. But the conference is also forward-looking. Where and how might Australia contribute more purposefully to the peace and security agenda? Of course, in a two-day conference, it is not possible to cover everything. Our managerial committee decided not to focus on specific case studies, such as Australia's significant contributions to Cambodia, Timor-Leste and the Solomon Islands, amongst others, which have previously been addressed in other fora. Rather, we thought it best to cover these contributions in a more collective way during session one, and then to give attention to a couple of contemporary conflicts in which Australia is supporting the United Nations, namely in Iraq and in South Sudan. We also decided to focus on critical thematic areas where Australia might be able to contribute more purposefully to peace operations, peace building and conflict prevention. These are self-evident, I think, in your program. Unfortunately, we could not cover everything for example, Australia's significant commitment to UN mine action and UN assistance and, and Australia's and the UN assistance to the conduct of democratic elections. There was just not space in the program. We are hoping if we get a book out of this that we can add those to the book. Matthew highlighted some minor changes to our printed conference program. Unfortunately, I have another change to announce. Jose Ramos Horta sends his sincere apologies and very much regrets not being able to join us. He is a great supporter of the United Nations Association of Australia, but political events in the wake of the recent and very peaceful elections in Timor-Leste have required him to stay in Dili and assist the Prime Minister-elect, Dr Marie al in the formation of the new government that I think will probably be announced today. If my information is correct, José Ramos Horta will be appointed as a Senior Cabinet Minister and National Security Advisor to the Prime Minister with responsibilities for foreign affairs, defence and security. He will also represent Timor-Leste in the General Assembly in New York in lieu of President Luolo, who needs to preside over the formation of the new government in Dili. His non-attendance at this conference is regrettable, but certainly understandable under the circumstances. And he has asked Janelle Safin to speak on his behalf. And I thank Janelle for agreeing to do so and more so because Janelle is a member of the United Nations Association of Australia. The UN is deeply indebted to Dr Brendan Nelson, the Director of the Australian War Memorial and his dedicated team for agreeing to host this conference. Knowing his infectious passion for the War Memorial and his strong commitment to peace, I can think of no better person to start our conference, particularly as he is such a fabulous speaker. His bio is in your program. Ladies and gentlemen, the, Octa, the Honourable Dr Brendan Nelson AO, Director of the Australian War Memorial. Thank you very much, uh, Mike, for your very generous introduction and, uh, more importantly, your leadership of UNAA and uh, a lifetime of commitment to peace. Uh, the, the excellencies that are here, uh, I miss all that, actually. Uh, I used to be your excellency, but, um, but the excellencies that are here, uh, particularly Marty Natalagawa, uh, I saw, I never thought I'd be sitting in my office and see 
uh, such a wonderful man walk across the lawns just under me and uh, a couple of kangaroos running off in the distance. Uh, His Excellency the East Timorese Ambassador or the Ambassador for Afghanistan, uh, Her Excellency Penny Winsley, uh, David Horner, Ian Martin, uh, all of you who have come here to the conference, uh, thank you for everything you do, whether it be in government or non-government, in Australia, in our regional and more distant neighbourhood, thank you. As I was sitting there, uh, knowing that I was coming up to speak to you very shortly, uh, thinking about what I might say, I I reflected that it's five years uh, this month that I came back to Australia from Brussels. I was our ambassador to NATO and the European Union. And I came back uh, for an interview for this job. And about three weeks later, I was called by the then Secretary of the Department of Veterans Affairs to inform me that I had been appointed and that I was going to be the director of the Australian War Memorial. I confided in a very small number of my close friends that this was what I was going to do when I returned to Australia. And one of them said to me, you're what? You're going to run the Australian War Memorial? You're wasting your life, he said. You've got far more important things to do for Australia than rearrange its history. And I said to him in part, well, It's actually got a lot more to do with the future than it does the past. At the opposite end of Anzac Parade, on either side of which are those memorials, to our nurses, our Navy, Army, Air Force, New Zealand, and now our peacekeepers, across the lake is the political capital of our nation, our parliament, where we exercise our political, economic and religious freedoms. Freedoms which too often my generation of Australians in particular have taken for granted. Whether Australian by birth or by choice, too often we take for granted the fact that we live in a nation where faith coexists with reason, with free academic inquiry, an independent judiciary, a free press. But it's here at the Australian War Memorial we reveal our soul, we reveal our character. It's hard to understand us as Australians until you come here. It's not the building, it's not the artefacts and relics that are displayed within it, but it's the stories. Stories of two million Australian men and women who wear and who have worn the uniform of our Royal Australian Navy, Australian Army and Royal Australian Air Force. For those of you who don't know, the origins of this institution are the First World War. Its founder was a man called Charles Bean, chosen by his colleagues to be the official correspondent for the First World War. He landed with our troops on Gallipoli on the 25th of April 1915, where foolishly at the behest of the British we were trying to invade Turkey. He stayed with them at the front through the entire war. Risk death, it was said, more often than anyone else. At Pozier, France, in 1916, over a six-week period, he was witness to 23,000 Australian casualties in six weeks, 6,800 dead, five Victoria Crosses, and a mortally wounded Australian asked him, will they remember me in Australia? And from there he conceived and resolved at its end. He would build this the finest memorial and museum to these men of the Australian Imperial Force and to the nurses. In 1948, three years after the conclusion of an even greater cataclysm, he articulated the vision for this institution. Vision in a civilian context differentiates leadership from management. You would have seen it inscribed in the Reg Saunders Gallery the only place in this entire building, by the way, named in honour of one person. Reg Saunders, a proud Aboriginal Australian who served in Fourth, Second World War, Korean War. Here is their spirit, in the heart of the land they loved, and here we guard the record which they themselves made. We remain true to that vision, trying to make this history live, make it engaging to and engaged by a new generation of Australians in a world that Bean could not possibly have imagined. It was only a year before him, 
articulating that vision that of course the first uh, UN peacekeeping operation conducted to which Australia contributed, the UN Consular Commission in uh, Indonesia. We have contributed to 61 peacekeeping missions since. When I arrived here formally to start in this job on the 17th of December 2012, amongst the many things that I observed looking at this institution through new and different eyes, was that when I stood in that commemorative area up there around that pool of reflection and looked at those names in bronze of the theatres where Australians have fought and died over more than a hundred years, the very last one that was named was Vietnam. Now it includes East Timor, the Solomon Islands, and of course Iraq and Afghanistan. The mother of an Australian soldier, Private Jamie Clark, fully armed, looking for weapons caches in the Solomon Islands in March 2005, asked me, why is my son's name not on those bronze panels, on the Roll of Honour? Why is his life and what he was doing of any lesser value than any one of those others? Similarly, the daughter of Captain Peter McCarthy, who was in our Australian Army uniform, wearing a UN beret and a blue helmet in Lebanon in 1988, killed when we went over a landmine. His daughter asked me, why can't I put a poppy next to my father's name? Amongst those who were steadfastly resisting adding Australian peacekeepers and those killed in humanitarian and disaster relief to the role of honour were people who said, oh, peacekeepers, if they get killed, it's in a car accident. Uh, or there will be some misadventure. It's not like a war. Well, obviously anyone who has that view was not one of the peacekeepers uh, in Rwanda, Kibaho, was not one of those particularly early on who went into East Timor in 1999, or was there with those 16,000 others in Cambodia with General Sanderson, or any one of the other peacekeeping operations. In fact, Ben Robert Smith, an Australian SAS corporal recipient of the Victoria Cross and the Medal of Gallantry, when I was speaking to him about this issue four years ago, he said, well, you've got an idea what I do. I said, yeah. He said, I'd rather do what I do than be an unarmed peacekeeper on the Golan Heights. In this place, we are on a journey of change. And you will see as you walk down the entrance corridor today, and if you haven't, please do so, the timeline of peacekeeping operations to which my country has contributed. You will see images of Australian men and women, military and non-military, in different theatres of operation in peacekeeping on behalf of my country and almost always under the auspices of the United Nations. In our galleries, we have four principal depictions, uh, Rwanda, uh, the civil war, the genocide, very confronting, uh, Somalia, and uh, uh, not only what was done in terms of observation and famine relief, but also the role of the Royal Australian Navy, not just logistics, but weapons interdiction and uh, counter piracy. Uh, Cambodia, of course, the Khmer Rouge, the mines, and give people a sense of the immense risks that were undertaken. And then, of course, East Timor. Our biggest challenge here, apart from conservative traditionalism, is a lack of space. And I have been arguing at the most senior levels of our government to support our plans to expand this space. And amongst the arguments, I said, my nation, that's our nation, has contributed to 62 peacekeeping operations. The floor space that we've got to tell those stories is about that of a 7-Eleven. We need a commitment. And, uh, and I think that we will, will get there in this regard. The Second World War had four, in my opinion, four major consequences, geostrategic consequences for Australia. The first was that we knew that we could no longer rely on the British for our defence, and we would look instead across the Pacific to the United States. The origins of that alliance was the Cor Battle of the Coral Sea in May 1942, formalised in 1951. The second was it would be the end of colonialism in our region. And 
Australia would be able to deal with an emergent, much more confident, independent Asia, hopefully on equal and respected terms. The third was that it would start, of course, what would be a generation and a half of the struggle between democracy and communism, which would shape Australia's uh, view of the world, its place in it, and contributions or otherwise to conflicts and other operations. And it would also uh, be a period where Australia would be an early committer to multilateralism. Uh, I am a former member of the Australian Parliament, and Janelle Safin is here. We serve together, different sides, but um, you'll hear from time to time our governments uh, have varying degrees of commitment, it would seem, to the United Nations. Uh, we recently heard uh, some several years ago now we wanted more Jakarta and less Geneva. But whatever happens in our country, you'll never hear an Australian Prime Minister say we want no Geneva and all Jakarta. Uh, it's extraordinarily important to us as Australians, and you appreciate it when you come here, of why this commitment is one that needs to be sustained and upheld. You are gathering here in this memorial, uh, just as the North Koreans have launched another missile over Japan. Uh, three years ago, the then chief of the Australian Army stood in the commemorative area and addressed 400 of his uniformed personnel on the occasion of the Australian Army. And he said to his officers and men and women, he said, we, the Australian Army, will need to prepare for the long peace. That as after the Vietnam War, uh, that there would be a long period of low operational activity. I said to him afterwards, I said, David, I, I hope you're right, but I actually think you're wrong. Three years later, a former chief of our Defence Force, uh, Admiral Chris Barry, uh, says that we're all heading uh, to war. In my opinion, uh, the world, of course, is always changing, but as Paul Kennedy, the Richard Dilworth Professor of History and head of its International Security Studies Centre, uh, wrote in uh, 2011, a quite thoughtful essay, that sometimes humankind goes through a major transformation without a cataclysm, such as the Napoleonic Wars of the Second World War, and we don't realise the scale and dimension of what's happening. Uh, for example, what happened in the late 15th century to the early uh, 16th century. Perhaps now we're moving through such a period. Uh, the re-emergence of China, that China-US relationship that's being forged in our region, the diminishing role of the US dollar as reserve currency, he argued that the in key instruments of the United Nations are failing the world that is, let alone the one that's coming, and in particular the Security Council. And of course, uh, we're living in a world where we have volatile leadership from the United States, we have resurgent nationalism, we have a repudiation of liberal and open markets, we have a crisis in the Anglosphere with the exception of perhaps Canada and New Zealand, mass mobilisation of people, we are fighting resurgent totalitarianism, principally but not only in the form of those who've hijacked the name of Islam to build a violent political utopia. And we also have a resurgent class war, for want of a better expression. Resentment from people who don't have toward those who do, both within and between countries, and some political leaders who seek to capitalise on that. And in that context, uh, Walter Scheidel, the Stanford academic who published that brilliant book, uh, The Study of the History of Inequality from the Stone Age to the 21st Century, has found there's only four things that have had any impact on inequality, and it's got nothing to do with things that governments have intentionally done. Pandemics and epidemics, which change the value of labour and land. The second is the collapse of entire civilizations and economies, the Roman Empire, the Tang Dynasty. The third is uh, communism, uh, but revolutions in the form of uh, Russia and China, and then mass mobilisation for war, with increases in taxes, property taxes, destruction of capital, the mass mobilisation of people, post-war inflation, and increased union membership. And then, just uh, finally, Margaret Macmillan, the great Canadian academic who, in her book, The War That, the, the war that Ended Peace, about the First World War, reminded us that in that uh, world 
after the unification of Germany in 1871, as Henry Kissinger also observed in his book on China, where diplomacy was a zero-sum game. But there were many people that thought that a war was a good way to end the crises, to end decadence in Europe, and that crisis was seen as a form of uh, muscular diplomacy and responding to it in a muscular way was regarded as an appropriate way to go. In my opinion, uh, there is much, much greater need for multilateralism than there has ever been. The United Nations principally, uh, I have come back from uh, Europe, uh, the diplomats would say perhaps I caught the disease, but I, uh, there's a lot to complain about with the European Union, but I can tell you the world is going to be a much less safe and secure place uh, with a fractured uh, Europe and uh, Europe is too often focused on its own issues and to have it ev being even more introspective is not in any of our interests. Finally, in this place, the paradox, as I say to young people, if they don't know what the word means, I explain it to them, but the paradox is called the Australian War Memorial. It's not actually about war. It's about love and friendship love for friends and between friends, it's honouring men and women whose lives are devoted not to themselves but to us and their last moments to one another. And when I was in Europe and on one occasion I addressed the Foreign Affairs Council, they were particularly concerned about China and uh, I say this uh, to Marty and others of you here, I said to them in part, do not export your foreign policy into the Asia-Pacific with a headline preoccupation with human rights, rule of law and diplomacy, all of which we agree with. Don't lecture these countries about their values, because if you do, you'll fail. You'll alienate and defend them. But be very clear about your own. Be very clear about who you are and in what you believe. And this place, more than anything else, is a reminder to us as Australians of what we believe in those values that define us, the truths by which we live, that we work very, very hard to defend politically and diplomatically, and sadly at times also militarily. In two years from now, two years from now, we will open an exhibition here, and this exhibition will tell the story of what my nation, Australia, does to prevent war, to act what we do to make, shape and keep peace to tell the story not just of men and women who wear our uniform, but those police officers, the diplomats, the election observers, the civilians who go at immense risk into other parts of the world to keep and maintain peace. In our RJ G Casey building, uh, which is the headquarters for all our diplomats here in uh, Canberra, you walk down corridors and there are photographs, in, and Marty's amongst them, and Jose Ramos Horta, photographs of Australian politicians, diplomats, doing extraordinary things. No one knows about it except the people in the building. I want to get the story here and I want to make sure people know that what is done in the name of diplomacy and peacekeeping is at least as valued, if not more valued, than those who are wearing a uniform. Because we're in a process of change in this institution to see that the recognition and rewards are not just for those who carry weapons and use them. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nelson. That was truly inspirational. And um, I'm really very pleased to be here and to have heard a little about what goes on at the War Memorial. Um, and I'm sure, as you all agree, would agree that it is such an imposing place and we're very fortunate to have it here. Thank you. May I claim you as a South Australian as well? Yes. Am I allowed to do that? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Library High School, saving notice. Oh. <laughs> That's where my husband went to school as well, so that's great. Thank you. Thank you for that. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, let me add my warm welcome to you all and to this iconic place, the Australian War Memorial. My name is Lydia Moretti. I am one of two 
UNAA vice presidents, and I'm also the president of the South Australian division of the UNAA. My bio is in the conference handbook. Australia has been engaged in peacekeeping for the past 70 years. We thought it sensible that we start this peacekeeping conference by recognising where Australians have served. I believe that it is particularly appropriate that Australia commenced our peacekeeping efforts by assisting one of our nearest neighbours, Indonesia, under the UN banner in their struggle for independence. But as you will hear from our two distinguished speakers, Australia's contributions have been and continue to be all over the globe. This session will run as follows. In a moment, I will invite Dr Peter Londi from ANU to speak for about 25 minutes. You're on a time limit, David, I'm sorry. Uh, on Australia's peacekeeping efforts and how they began in Indonesia. Dr Londi is highly qualified to speak on this subject as evidenced by his impressive bio, which is in your conference handbook. I would also like to acknowledge that in the audience we are honoured to have Mr Charles Eaton, the son of Charles Eaton Senior, who was central to our peacekeeping efforts in Indonesia. Charles has kindly prepared a very interesting paper about his father's exploits titled Charles Eaton and the United Nations Consular Commission in Indonesia, 1947-1948. This is a very interesting paper. Some of the copies are, are available in the ante room, so we can arrange additional copies for those who are interested. Just ask Jenna Allen. Following Dr. Londi's presentation, I will invite Dr. David Horner. Horner, I'm sorry about the pronunciation of your name. I'm so excited about saying that he's also um, an ex-South Australian. <laughs> Wonderful. David is one of Australia's official peacekeeping historians and he will also speak for 25 minutes, summarising Australia's peacekeeping experience both with the United Nations and in other settings. Dr Londi and Dr Horner have agreed to take questions for about 30 minutes, after which I will conclude the session. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr Peter Londi to address us. Does that make it go forward? Yes, thank okay, thank forward. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lydia. Uh, uh, well, David and I were told we had 30 minutes each, so you know, if I go over time, you know why. Uh, but also because I love talking. So, okay. Uh, so I just need to see how this works. Okay, we uh, marked yesterday the 70th anniversary of the uh, of Australian peacekeeping on a day which the rest of the world does not use as a commemorative day for peacekeeping because the rest of the world is misinformed and uh, doesn't really acknowledge that what happened in Indonesia in 1947 was peacekeeping. There are reasons for that, but uh, I won't go into them now. But on the 14th of September, 1947, uh, 70 years ago yesterday, the first four Australian peacekeepers went into the field and here they are there. I'll come back to them later. Uh, and because they were, in fact, the first people to arrive to serve for this UN mission, they were the first United Nations peacekeepers anywhere. This happened at a time of great optimism in the world. Uh, David Horner has sometimes chided me for wanting to use the term New World Order for the period after World War II, but there was a period of intense optimism at the time when the UN Charter was being drafted between April and June 19, uh, 1945, just before the end of World War II, and before the public knew about atomic weapons, which possibly tempered the enthusiasm a bit. So the UN Charter was drawn up in conferences at Dumbarton Oaks and here in San Francisco. And in many ways, it was an optimistic document, which... Uh, hoped to settle future conflicts in a much more peaceful way than had just occurred. Clearly, another world war had to be avoided. So aggressive nations like Japan and Germany had to be curbed in some way. But as many people have commented, it, the Charter focuses too much on that problem 
and missed the fact that many future conflicts would not be conflicts between one state and another, conflicts where one state was clearly the aggressor. They would be much more messy, and in fact, most conflicts since World War II have, in a sense, been civil conflicts. Uh, it, it was a failure of prescience, but it was also a failure to understand history. And I think we have to say the people at the, who drafted the Charter were very blinded by what had just happened in the 30s and during World War II itself, and simply failed to look at the lessons of history. And uh, they had failed even to read their Thucydides. And this is the only moment when I'll bring the ancient Greeks into this. Uh, Famously, Thucydides talks about Athenian aggression against the small island state of Milos in 416 BC, the classic case of a powerful state uh, being aggressive to a smaller one. But equally, Thucydides talks about the horrific internal conflict in the state of Corsara. Thucydides is very aware, for those who read him, of the messiness of other conflicts, that not every conflict falls into the, the format of State A attacking State B. Uh, nevertheless, the Charter in Chapters 6 and 7, which deal with security, peace and security, really only envisages cases where one state attacks another. And that's all the more surprising, given that the Charter itself carried the seeds for most of the messy conflicts which have in fact occurred. because. Where, and let me just say something about this. Uh, the Charter was also arrogant in a sense, because although the United Nations was very much modelled in its structure on the League of Nations, which had existed between the wars, the League in peace and security terms was adjudged to have been a failure. And that has become the dominant narrative about it. And that meant that the people who drew up the Charter failed to think about the things which the League had managed to achieve. And one of the things which the League of Nations actually achieved was to invent peacekeeping. The original peacekeepers were working for the League of Nations, uh, firstly as military observers in uh, as various conflicts soon after World War I, and then uh, in the uh, uh, a series of larger forces which supervised uh, the holding of plebiscites acts of self-determination by various territories, most famously in the Tsar territory, uh, which voted in 1935 whether to stay as part of France or go back to Germany. The League of Nations set up a four-nation body uh, force of over 3,000 men who supervised this plebiscite and uh, achieved a peaceful plebiscite in conditions which, where that might well not have happened. All that was actually forgotten. And the United Nations ended up having to reinvent peacekeeping. The thing which ensured that there would be many uh, messy and ambiguous conflicts in the post-World War was not that, was that, was decolonisation. In 1945, a third of the world's population still lived uh, under colonial masters. The United Nations Charter has very strong provisions and much stronger ones than the League of Nations Covenant had to uh, address that problem and a very strong presumption that all colonised peoples should be being brought towards independence. Now, it probably was, I think, possible to foresee that that would lead to a large number of conflicts and they would be messy and difficult conflicts where the two sides, it wasn't a case of one side being aggressive against another. Either colonised people would want independence uh, or there would be conflicts between people, perhaps both with legitimate aspirations after freedom uh, from colonial masters was won. This also coincided with, I think, one of the heroic ages of Australian foreign policy, led by Dr. Herbert Veer Evatt, the Minister for External Affairs, who had himself played quite a notable role in the San Francisco Conference, which drafted the UN Charter, and that's Evatt with his team, I don't know if there's a button here, uh, uh, which attended the conference. Uh, Everett had played quite a notable role in this conference as an advocate of middle power diplomacy. Uh, 
and later went on to become president of the UN General Assembly. Everett was a great believer and remained a great believer in the United Nations as an instrument for solving conflicts and certainly preferred to use the multilateral approach rather than alliance politics. He believed very strongly in Australia's role as an independent middle power, not simply a country which would do whatever Britain or the US uh, told it to. And he believed very strongly in Australia's regional role as the leading Western country in our part of the world. Into this situation, where Australia was very keen, actually, to get involved in helping solve other people's problems, uh, came the problem of Indonesia. The Netherlands East Indies had been ruled by the Dutch for uh, mostly most of it for 150 years. In the early 20th century, the Dutch had had what they called an, the ethical policy, which did try to advance people's education and economic development. And yet, by 1930, only 7% of the Indonesian population was literate. Uh, by 1939, only 2,228 Indonesians out of a population of 70 million could actually vote for a representative in the Volksrad, the only uh, representative uh, body open to them. Uh, in this situation, there had been several Indonesian nationalist movements between the wars, but they had been crushed by the Dutch colonialists. But then came World War II and the Japanese occupation of the Netherlands East Indies. Uh, and in 1945, when the Japanese were defeated, as a parting gesture, they tacitly allowed the Indonesian Republicans to declare independence. So the Indonesian Republic was uh, formally declared as existing just after the end of the war, which meant that the Dutch, who had expected simply to walk back in and take over their colonial territory again, found that there was considerable armed opposition to that and that it was never going to be easy to reinstate their position as the colonial masters. For a while, the British helped them, uh, and in fighting in Surabaya, uh, actually killed something like 6,000 Indonesians. But what happened was that, for the time being, the Indonesian Republicans ended up controlling the whole of Java and Sumatra, while the Dutch uh, re retained control of most of the other parts of uh, what is now Indonesia. This was a difficult position for the Australian government. The Dutch were our wartime allies, and in one sense, we, their claim to go back into a territory which they had apparently legally controlled before the war was a perfectly legal and legitimate claim. But at the same time, Australia was committed to the idea, as Brendan Nelson said, of self-determination, of uh, the freedom of colonial, uh, colonial peoples. Uh, during the war, Evert actually flirted with the idea that the Dutch should be pressured into leasing the Netherlands East Indies to Australia. Uh, not quite clear how he thought that was going to work. Uh, and there was the belief that if Australia didn't support Indonesian independence, we would earn the lasting enmity of a, a closely neighbouring people. At first, Australia was inclined to support the Dutch, but the position shifted between 1945 and 1947. So by 1947, Australia had moved to be strongly in favour of Indonesian independence. A political scientist, McMahon Ball, had been sent to Indonesia and had recommended support for in independence and also recommended that the United Nations should be involved. In mid-1946, Justice Richard Kirby uh, went to Indonesia to investigate the deaths of three Australian war crimes investigators. Uh, he then took on something of a political role, partly because one of the uh, Australian diplomats there was sick, and met here the Indonesian Prime Minister at the time, that is the Prime Minister of the self-declared Indonesian Republic, Sutan Syaria, I never know how to pronounce that, uh, Kirby was very unimpressed by the population's lack of access to things like medicine and education. Uh, he was also very un unimpressed when he saw Indonesian servants prostrating themselves in the governor's residence in Batavia, now Jakarta. Australians 
had changed in their attitudes markedly since before the war. Uh, a lot of Australians had had contact with uh, various peoples in Asia during the war, and Australia now did see the world differently from the Dutch, uh, who still seem to regard themselves as the superior white colonial masters. Kirby came back convinced of the genuine strength of the Republican cause, and his views certainly found their way to the Australian government. So increasingly, the Australians found the Dutch simply intransigent and shifted their support to the Indonesians. In November 1946, there was an agreement at Lingajati, uh, brokered by the British, that uh, uh, the Republic would get control Java, Sumatra, and Madura, three of the main islands, uh, but that they would then join with the other parts of Indonesia in a federation under the Dutch crown. But having arrived at this agreement through mainly you know, pressure of the um, negotiations, nothing further happened. And the situation then simply drifted until in mid-1947, in July 1947, the Dutch lost patience with the whole situation and took military action by invading uh, in, uh, Republican-held territory. Before the, uh, what the Dutch called the a police action, they had controlled the areas in that map marked in purple. There must be, is there a light on this thing? Does anybody know? Well, I can't work out how it works. Ah, yeah. Okay, so they controlled these little areas around Surabaya, Batavia, and Palembang, but they uh, expanded out to control these green areas, or more or less control them. This was too much, though, for various other countries and for the United Nations. This resort to military action triggered an appeal to the United Nations by both India and Australia. Britain and the US did not want this to go to the United Nations. They were very suspicious of the fact that the Soviet Union had a lot of influence on the Security Council, and the one thing they really wanted to avoid was Soviet uh, involvement in this conflict. But, uh, and what they preferred was an approach of good officers where they themselves would help the parties negotiate a settlement. Uh, the Dutch were certainly happy with that idea and also did not want the United Nations involved, but the Indonesian Republicans were very keen to have U UN involvement. And as often, the weaker party is keen to sit, have the UN come in to support them against the more powerful. Australia was reluctant to go against the British, but eventually Evett decided that they should. And uh, on the proposal of Rick Throssell, uh, then a junior member of the Department of External Affairs, uh, the government decided to take the matter to the UN with a reference to Article 39 of the UN Charter, which is part of Chapter 7, uh, so peace, the Peace Enforcement Chapter. After some weeks of intermittent debate, the UN set up two missions. One was a, a consular commission composed of the Korea diplomats who were stationed in Batavia at the time. Six countries had Korea diplomats there, the six, uh, Australia, Belgium, China, France, the UK, and the USA, and those six consul generals would, consuls general, would form a consular commission which was to report back to the Security Council on what was happening on the ground. Basically, they were there to gather information for the Security Council. While a second body, UNGOC, the UN Committee of Good Officers, irrationally abbreviated UNGOC, uh, would be composed of one country nominated by each of the parties and then a third country that they would choose between them. The Indonesians, aware of Australian support for their cause, nominated Australia as their representative on UNGOC. The Dutch represent, uh, nominated their close neighbour in Europe, Belgium, and uh, together they got the US involved. The UNGOC took some time to set up, but by its very nature, the Consular Commission, because the consuls were already in place in Batavia, could go into action straight away. The only consul who wasn't actually in place was Charles Eaton, uh, the man on the right there, uh, seen later meeting President Sukarno. Uh, Eaton was rushed from his previous post at Dili to take over the currently vacant role of Australian Consul General in Batavia. 
Originally born in Britain, uh, Eaton was a very well-known Australian aviator who had served with the RAAF throughout World War II. Uh, Charles Eaton Jr. Uh, gave me these two photos, and I'll just digress for a moment. Uh, these photos show how easy the history of peacekeeping might have been different. These are training crashes with the Royal Flying Corps in 1917. Uh, they look as if the, the occupants were lucky to get out alive. And if they hadn't, then the history of peacekeeping would have been different. The left-hand one is a crash by Charles Eaton, who then went up again and apparently became a decent flyer after that. <laughs> the right-hand one is a crash by Lester Pearson, who in fact crashed, had two crashes and after that was discharged as obviously not fit to fly. <laughs> Afterwards he went to London to recuperate and was hit by a bus, but <laughs> survived all that to go on and become the Canadian Secretary of State for uh, External Affairs and in 1956 after the Suez Crisis was in instrumental in proposing a UN buffer force, the United Nations Emergency Force in the Sinai. Uh, so Lester Pearson, the Canadians all regard Lester Pearson as the father of peacekeeping. As Australians, we can regard Charles Eaton as the father of peacekeeping. So uh, it's lucky that those crashes weren't as fatal as they look. Eaton was now a diplomat. He'd responded to a newspaper ad calling for a representative in Dili. And so he rushed off to, uh, to Batavia and got involved with uh, the work of the Consular Commission. The Consular Commission got to work very quickly and very soon was sending out groups of two or three of the consuls with diplomatic staff to make inspections on, in both the Republican and the Dutch held areas. And there is the first inspection uh, being, uh, so Charles Eaton is the man here, and Etienne Rowe, the French uh, consul general, is with him. These inspections were important. They provided a lot of information to the Security Council about the general situation, but to some extent the consuls tended to reflect the prejudices of their home governments. And some of the countries were quite pro-Dutch and some like Australia were, especially Australia, was quite pro-Republican. The US tended to sit on the fence. Uh, they affirmed that there was considerable support for the Republicans, but also that there had been a lot of violence by Republican forces against local Chinese communities. This engagement by the diplomats seems to be what the Security Council had had in mind in setting up the Consular Commission. But there's no hint in the, UN, in the Security Council resolutions that they would need any form of military observers, that they would need military staff. The Security Council seems to have assumed that diplomats could do the job. But, in fact, at the first meeting of the Consular Commission, and this isn't the first meeting, it's a later meeting, but it's the best we can do, uh, the six consuls had agreed to ask their home governments to provide military assistance, to provide some military officers to help them with their work. And thus was born peacekeeping, because it is the introduction of the military into the situation which turns this from a diplomatic mission into a peacekeeping one. Why did they need military assistance? Uh, mainly it has to do with the military situation. The Dutch had uh, nominally conquered the areas in green on that map, but what they had in fact done was moved out in quite fast-moving columns down the main roads and left large pockets of resistance uh, in existence in the spaces between those columns. When they were forced into a ceasefire by the Security Council, they then drew a line on the map uh, through their most forward points and called it the Van Mook line. Uh, and they regarded that as the front line between them and the Republicans. And the Van Mook line uh, is the set of lines marked in black on that map. Now, obviously, the Republicans were not very happy with that interpretation because they had very large numbers of troops still now trapped on the wrong side of the Van Mook line in the spaces between the areas of Dutch advance. And this made for a very messy situation. The Republican troops felt they were fighting a war here, uh, but the Dutch, now that a ceasefire had been imposed, regarded mopping up those Republican units as simply a matter of imposing law and order. 
So clearly, the situation open, was totally open to both uh, conflicting interpretations and was very messy and fluid. And it was very difficult, I think, for the six consuls and their diplomatic staff to actually monitor what was happening, partly because there weren't enough of them and partly because they perhaps didn't have the military experience to do it effectively. And that, I think, is why at the first meeting of the Consular Commission, they could immediately see what, the, what they needed was some experienced army officers. And it, all the army officers who come to, uh, all the military officers who come to the Consular Commission, of course, had just fought through World War II. They are immensely experienced officers. It's impossible to say on the basis of the sources I've read who actually made the proposal for the military assistance. Uh, the dominant parties on the Consular Commission were Eton and um, I don't know, I've got that there. Uh, Eton and oh, I'll go back. Eton, the man with the pipe in the middle, and the American Consul General, Walter Foote, who was sort of an Indonesia veteran and knew the situation very well. Eaton was an energetic military man, probably the only one of the consuls with recent military experience. Uh, John Burton, the young secretary of the Department of External Affairs, later wrote that he was relieved that Eaton was available uh, because he was impressed with his objectivity and willingness to cope with a new situation. Francis Shepard, the British consul, commented that Eaton was the most energetic of the consuls, determined to observe as fast and as often as he can manage. That wasn't necessarily meant to be praise, I think, and I think it's actually a, an attitude which Australian peacekeepers have tended to spark in other people ever since, that they're always possibly excessively keen to get on with the job. Undoubtedly, the Australian government was very worried that the Dutch were improving their military situation under cover of the ceasefire. So it's entirely possible that Eton came with a proposal to get military observers into the situation. Unfortunately for Australian pride, though, there is also some evidence that the Americans had been thinking along these lines. F uh, four days before the meeting, the State Department had cabled Foote, the American consul, uh, saying, the department will arrange such military, naval and air personnel as may be required. Consult with other career consuls and formulate plan for ex executing above mission. So clearly the Americans were also thinking of using some military observers in this situation. Uh, the Chinese consul was actually not at the meeting. The British consul had failed to receive any instructions, so he just took on observer status. Uh, okay. And uh, so it may well have been that Foote, the veteran, and uh, Eaton, the energetic, uh, the energetic Eaton, were able to uh, push the idea through, possibly with opposition from the French and Belgian, we don't know. A British report on the meeting uh, no, written that day noted that the role of the observers was to observe any possible violations of the ceasefire order, to investigate where possible allegations of violations of the ceasefire order, and to gather any other data that might be of value to the consular mission and to the Security Council, and that they would go to the particularly troubled areas to do this. Australia was very ready to provide these observers, and uh, they actually arrived in Batavia only 12 days after the request had been made, which does suggest that Australia may have foreseen it. Brigadier Lewis Dyke, the, command, the senior officer, had commanded Timor Force and accepted the Japanese surrender on Timor in 1945. Major David Campbell, uh, the man at the back, oh, sorry, the man at the back uh, had been on Bougainville. Lou Spence, uh, the man in the middle there, uh, was from the RAAF and would later be kill killed in Korea. And Commander Henry Chesterman, and I think it's him at the very far right on the edge of that photo, uh, also had served in the Pacific and in West New Guinea. Uh, the Department of External Affairs, apparently, apparently sniffing the hi historical nature of the moment, had asked Defence to provide three uh, uh, to provide observers from all three services. The Australians arrived first and went into the field immediately. So on the 14th of September, they flew to uh, Jogjakarta, the Republican capital, and then they split into two groups, 
Two of them are monitored in the Republican areas and the other two in the, uh, the Dutch areas. After a fortnight of this, they met again and compiled a joint report. So both groups were no doubt a bit in the hands of their hosts in, in terms of uh, transport and interpreters, but by compiling a joint report after their tour, they, I think, did arrive at some degree of impartiality. The report was partly just descriptive of conditions, but it also, yeah, it also invest, sort of, in a sense, criticised the exam question, like the best students. Uh, they criticised the wording of the Security Council resolutions uh, and pointed out the ambiguity of the whole notion of a ceasefire in this situation where the two parties interpreted the situation so differently. As I think peacekeepers have often had to do since, they had to think about the politics of the situation. It wasn't simply a mechanical task. They were in there thinking about what was happening. I'm just going to go on for another couple of minutes, OK? Almost given 30. Um, the other observers soon arrived. The last to arrive actually were the Americans, oddly enough. Uh, and in late 1947, they were transferred to, the, um, to operate under UNGOC, though still nominally under control of the Consular Commission. UNGOC needed to find political solutions, and it consulted the observers. It asked them, how should we go about this? How can we stop, stop the fighting? The observers were giving a what was, in effect, both political and military advice right from the start. Uh, Ultimately, the observers recommended accepting the Van Mook line as simply a fait accompli, however unjust, and an agreement in uh, January 1948 accepted that. They set up demilitarised zones, which the observers helped mark out and uh, help, then helped monitor. The observers came under a military executive board composed of the senior observers from the Six Nations. Uh, and in 1948, as I've talked about before, they had a conference where they established a lot of the principles of impartiality, of working in mixed nationality teams, of working with people on both sides of the line, which have actually uh, worked for UN peacekeeping ever since. Indonesia was not the success story often claimed. UNGOC, which eventually got going with Justice Kirby as the Australian representative, actually completely failed to get the Dutch and Indonesians to uh, come to an agreement. Uh, UN good officers actually consistently failed in places like uh, um, Indonesia, Kashmir, Cyprus, the Middle East. In the end, the Dutch solved the problem for the UN by taking a further police action uh, in which they conquered the whole of Java, large chunks of Sumatra, and captured the Republican leadership and basically held them captive. Uh, this was just too much for world opinion. The UN then imposed a much tougher force which much, with much stronger uh, terms of reference, and the Americans then put the pressure on the Dutch to concede independence, uh, which happened in December of 1949. The UN, I think, consistently failed in its attempts to solve problems through good officers, and actually that didn't work very well because they could never get a stronger military power to agree to things which weren't in its own interest. But what did come out of Indonesia was the idea of military observers, soon taken up in Greece, in Kashmir, in the Middle East uh, with UNSO, uh, and even briefly in Korea. For Australia, this was the start of 70 years of peacekeeping, and there have been Australian peacekeepers in the, uh, on the ground uh, every day since 1947 and David will attempt to weigh out the importance of their contribution. There are just two lessons which could be learned from this, and I think the most important one in this, these days, I'll skip through a few here, uh, of uh, increasingly Soviet management of everything in our society, including universities, sadly, uh, is that the decisions which created peacekeeping were not made in New York. They were made here in this room in Batavia in 1947. The people on the ground who could immediately see the problems and what they needed to solve them were the ones who invented peacekeeping. Not only the Consular Commission, but also the peacekeepers themselves who got out there and could see the problems once they were actually engaged with them. The other thing is that impartiality is always difficult. That was the case... Uh, 
if you read that, uh, you'll see that uh, in this fairly early inspection, uh, the peacekeepers from the different countries just could not agree with each other because they were carrying some of the views of their own countries with them. Uh, that's always going to be a problem. Peacekeepers are always uh, a resource for both parties and uh, an idea elegantly expressed in that painting by George Gittos. But really, the origins of that problem can already be seen in Indonesia in 1947, which is where United Nations peacekeeping began. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Peter Londi, for giving us that um, perspective of the beginnings of, um, first of all, the League of Nations and the UN and the strong role that um, Dr. Evett played in the establishment of the United Nations, and also giving us an insight into the peacekeeping efforts in our region. Um, uh, and it's encouraging to know that Australia has played a role in peacekeeping efforts around the world. I would now like to invite Dr. David Horner to make his presentation. Thank you, David. But before that, could we thank Dr. Peter Londi, please? Well, thank you very much for that uh, introduction, and it's a great pleasure to be here this morning at this most interesting conference. By 1988, Australia had been sending military personnel and police to United Nations and other peacekeeping missions for more than 40 years, and it claimed a proud, if limited, record of contributing to UN peacemaking and peacekeeping endeavours. In emphasising this point, Australian government ministers and senior public servants often recalled the role of the former Australian Foreign Minister, Dr Evatt, in helping to establish the United Nations. <coughs> For example, in 1988, the Foreign Minister, Senator Gareth Evans, reminded the General Assembly that Australia was a traditional supporter of the UN's peacekeeping activities. Yet despite these fine words, at this time Australia's commitment to international peacekeeping consisted of just 20 police in the UN peacekeeping force in Cyprus, UNFASIP, and 13 military personnel in the UN Truce Supervision Organisation, UNSO, supervising the ceasefire arrangements between Israel and its Arab neighbours. By any comparison, this was only a modest contribution. For example, Canada, with a population one and a half times Australia's, had 850 personnel <coughs> on peacekeeping operations. While even New Zealand, with one fifth, uh, one fifth the size of Australia, it had 35 military personnel on peacekeeping operations. Nonetheless, in two and a half years, between August 1988 and February 1991, Australia deployed almost 2,400 military personnel to peacekeeping and related operations in Iran, Namibia, Pakistan, the Persian Gulf and Kuwait. This expansion in Australian peacekeeping missions also corresponded with an increasing willingness after a break of almost 20 years to send forces overseas in support of Australia's national interests. The distinction between peacekeeping and other operations became blurred. Two events came together to create the circumstances by which Australia became involved in these activities. The first event was the end of the Cold War. As a result, the United Nations initiated many new peacekeeping missions between 1988 and 1990, and thus it gave Australia the opportunity to play an expanded role. And the second event was the existence of a Labor government in Australia that was committed to playing both a role in multilateral peace efforts and to supporting the US alliance. <coughs> Substantial groundwork for Australia's contribution to peace initiatives was laid by the Foreign Minister Bill Hayden. His successor, Gareth Evans, however, 
approached the task even more vigorously, and as he said, with a profound sense of hope that the United Nations could resolve conflicts around the world. Evans saw himself as continuing the tradition of Dr. Evatt and enthusiastically supported sending Australian forces on peacekeeping missions. There was, moreover, another strand to Labor, the Labor government's foreign policies. Prime Minister Bob Hawke uh, and his defence ministers, Kim Beasley and Robert Ray, were strong supporters of the US alliance. They too looked to Labor's past, reflecting on the importance of the relationship with the United States that had been promoted by the Curtin government in the Second World War. But they also believed in the continuing relevance of that relationship and were well disposed towards Australia's requests for assistance. Their acceptance of these requests was made easier, perhaps only possible because they could be linked with an appeal from the United Nations, thus remaining in harmony with the Evatt tradition. So let me briefly review Australia's peacekeeping missions between August 1988 and January 1991. And the first was the deployment of 15 Australian Army officers to Iran in August 1988 as part of the UN Iran-Iraq Military Observer Group, UNIMOG. This mission grew out of UN efforts to end the long-running war between Iraq and Iran. Foreign Minister Hayden supported the commitment because it was a clear UN mandate for an observer force. It was in line with the government's supportive, sympathetic approach to UN peacekeeping, and it was for a limited period. By the time UNIMOG finished in 1990, a total of 60 Australian Army officers had served in Iran. Now, by that time, more Australian peacekeepers had been deployed. In 1979, the Fraser government had agreed to send an engineer construction squadron to Namibia, southwest Africa, as part of a UN mission to support elections for a new nation. But the peace agreement could not be signed until the end of the Cold War brought a new approach by the concerned parties. And when this was achieved in August 1988, Australia honoured its earlier commitment. Prime Minister Hawke was a strong opponent of apartheid, and Defence Minister Beasley was working to strengthen the US alliance. And the peace agreement had been largely brokered by the United States. The Australian contingent started arriving in Namibia in March 1989. A second contingent was rotated in September and October 1989, and it withdrew after the successful elections in February 1990. Some 644 Australians served in Namibia. Meanwhile, another mission had begun. After the Soviet Union withdrew from Afghanistan in February 1989, the United Nations began training Afghan refugees in Pakistan as deminers so that they could deal with the millions of landmines scattered throughout their country. Australia deployed a four-man team to take part in this program in July 1989. By the time the Australians withdrew in December 1993, they had become the mainstay of this program. A total of 92 Australians served in Pakistan and later in Afghanistan. When Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait in August 1990, the Hawke government committed a, task, a naval task group of two frigates and a supply ship to take part in the maritime interception force applying economic sanctions on Iraq. This operation had been endorsed by the UN Security Council and was in line with Hawke's view that Australia needed to play its part in collective security. But it was also in Australia's natural interest to support the United States. These interception operations, both before and after the 1991 Gulf War, could be considered a form of peacekeeping, although the actual war was clearly not peacekeeping. With the end of the Gulf War in March 1991, there was a further and very substantial expansion in UN peacekeeping activity, either as a consequence of the collapse of the Soviet Union at the end of 1991, or as a general outcome of the end of the Cold War. New peacekeeping or associated missions which began during the year after the end of the Gulf War are shown there on the screen. And Australia took part in eight of these 11 new missions. And it did so for a mixture of reasons. 
The Foreign Minister, Gareth Evans, believed that Australia had a role as a good international citizen to help promote peace around the world and more generally to support the United Nations. Prime Minister Hawke and successive Defence Ministers Kim Beasley and Robert Ray were strong supporters of the US alliance and they were willing to accede to US requests, especially for missions backed by the United Nations. Many of the missions grew out of the aftermath of the Gulf War. The defeat of Saddam Hussein did not resolve the problems in the Middle East. Saddam remained in power and Iraq still possessed weapons of mass destruction, WMD. So on the 3rd of April 1991, the UN Security Council adopted Resolution 687, sometimes called the mother of all resolutions, which set out the terms that Iraq needed to meet other san- uh, meet before the sanctions could be lifted. The resolution authorised inspectors working as part of the UN Commission on Iraq, UNSCOM, to enter Iraq, locate the WMD and supervise their destruction. Two days later, the Security Council passed another resolution which demanded that Iraq allow access by international humanitarian organisations to those in need in Iraq, including the Kurds, who were being attacked by Saddam's forces. President Bush immediately mounted a US-led coalition military operation to protect the Kurds, distribute supplies and provide medical assistance. The resolutions presented the Australian government with a series of challenges. Earlier, Evans had stated that Australia could play a helpful role in stopping the proliferation of weapons. Therefore, on the 10th of April 1991, Hawke, Evans and Ray approved Australia's involvement. It was the beginning of a commitment to UNSCOM, which was to last until 1998, and was to involve some 135 Australian Defence Force, ADF, officers, NCOs and government officials, many of whom made multiple visits. I'll just go back a bit. I must, must have got one out of, out of sync here. In fact, I'm sure that's out of sync. Anyway, we'll, we'll find, it, find it eventually. <coughs> we've jumped... Now I, we've jumped somehow in a very peculiar way. In fact, I've lost... We'll just go back and somehow I've lost half my, my, my presentation here, but we'll, we'll continue on. On the 22nd of April uh, 1991, the United States asked Australia to make a small military contribution to the coalition assisting the Kurds in northern Iraq. And as I mentioned, Evans was promoting the idea of the good international citizen. With that in mind, on the 30th of April, the Cabinet approved a contribution of 70 personnel known as Operation Habitat, to provide medical and water purification assistance. The force returned home in June after a one-month deployment. At the same meeting, Cabinet approved the commitment of 45 signalers to Western Sahara. The United Nations was sending a peacekeeping force to Western Sahara, known as MINURSO, to facilitate the referendum there. Evans wanted to gain favour with the United Nations mission at the United Nations at that time, and he was seeking to have Australia play a major role in Cambodia. The first contingent of signallers began arriving in Western Sahara in September 1991, and the force, after several rotations, remained there until 1994. A total of 225 Australians served in Western Sahara. Meanwhile, the government was under pressure to make another overseas commitment. On the 8th of April 1991, the United States asked Australia to continue to deploy ships to the Gulf to maintain sanctions against Iraq until it fulfilled the requirements of Resolution 687. The government was anxious to meet the US request, and if it contributed, Australia would be seen to be supporting the United Nations. So on the 13th of May, the government approved the deployment of the frigate HMAS Darwin and it was the first of five naval deployments known as Operation Damask over the next two and a half years. Throughout the period of 1990 and 1991, Gareth Evans and his department played a major role in helping to bring about a peace agreement in Cambodia, and it was therefore inevitable 
that Australia would contribute to the peacekeeping force. On the 24th of September 1991, the Cabinet approved a 40-strong communications unit to help set up the UN peacekeeping force, and a bit later, the Cabinet approved a contribution to the larger UN Transition Authority in Cambodia, UNTAC. And the United Nations accepted the appointment of the Australian Lieutenant General John Sanderson to command the UN force. The 550 strong Australian Force Communications Unit, which arrived in Cambodia in mid 1992, was the largest unit the Australian Army had sent overseas since the Vietnam War. Australia deployed other personnel to assist with the conduct of the elections in 1993. So by the end of 1991, Australia had committed to supporting six new missions. So let's now look at Australia's peacekeeping commitments between 1992 and 1995. And the first decision was in September 1992, when the government approved the deployment of a 30-strong ADF movement control unit to the UN operation in Somalia, um, un uh, UNISOM. Now, some of the language used to justify the commitment to Somalia was familiar. It would strengthen Australia's credentials as a good international citizen. It would also blunt criticism that Australia was not pulling its weight in Yugoslavia. And now we're back to the pictures. I don't know what happened to the 10 in between. who some, Somehow they've vanished between the time I delivered the, uh, the USB here and the time they've appeared on the screen. Australia made only a very limited contribution to the former Yugoslavia in 1991-92, which reflected the pragmatism of Defence Minister Ray, who declared that Europe was not a region of defence priority for Australia. But in October, the government agreed to deploy 26 officers and NCOs to the Multinational Force and Observers, the MFO in the Sinai, and that contingent arrived in January 1993. The commitment to Somalia was soon expanded when on the 15th of December 1992 the government agreed to deploy the 1RAR Battalion Group. And at the same meeting the government also decided to deploy, to deploy 45 personnel to Mozambique as part of the UN operation in Mozambique um, uh, on UMOZ. But only once the contribu contribution to Minerso, that's Western Sahara, was withdrawn. That is. The government still saw a need to support UN peacekeeping, but believed it did not have the capacity to support every mission to which it was asked to contribute. While the decision to send the battalion group to Somalia was in line with the government's policy to support UN peacekeeping, in other respects it was different. For Somalia, the UN Security Council had endorsed, under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter, the conduct of a US-led multinational peace enforcement operation. The Australian Battalion Group would therefore be deployed with rules of engagement that would allow its troops to use force to achieve the aims of the mission. The first time that Australian peacekeepers had been given this authority. And the decision was different for another reason. It was a major step to deploy a regular army infantry battalion. Until that time, in most cases, Australia had tried to ensure that the deployment of units and personnel on peacekeeping missions would not detract from the prime purpose of the ADF, namely the defence of Australia. As the regular army had only four infantry battalions, the deployment of one of them to Somalia, well outside Australia's area of direct military interest, immediately reduced Australia's capacity to respond to threats in its neighbourhood. On the other hand, Australian infantry battalions had not been involved in active operations since the Vietnam War in 1971, and Somalia provided valuable training which enhanced the Army's capability. While the commitment of the Movement Control Unit, <coughs> followed by headquarters staff officers, air traffic controllers and an airfield management team to UNISOM between October 1992 and November 1994, could be justified in terms of Australia being the good international citizen, the motivation for deploying the infantry battalion group was more complex. Now, 
There was still an element of the good international citizen, <clears throat> especially in the face of public agitation to do something about the widespread violence and humanitarian disaster in Somalia. But on top of this was the perceived need to respond positively to a request from the United States because in Somalia, the battalion group became part of the US-led unified force. <coughs> Australia's contribution to international peacekeeping reached a high point in May 1993. By that time, the Force Communications Unit in Cambodia was preparing to head home after a successful mission culminating in the free and fair Cambodian elections. Also by that time, the 1RAR Battalion Group was returning home from Somalia, having received much acclaim for its performance there. Australians were still serving in UNFASIP, UNISOM 2, UNSCOM, UNSO, the MFO, the former Yugoslavia, Pakistan, Western Sahara, and a frigate was in the Red Sea. But thereafter, the Australian government became more circumspect about peacekeeping. On the one hand, Evans retained his enthusiasm, and DFAT and the Department of Defence started to develop administrative procedures and policies to facilitate further peacekeeping missions. But on the other hand, the Defence Minister, Ray, conscious of the priority to ensure the Defence of Australia, was taking a more hard-headed look at the advantages and disadvantages. Most importantly, the international community was starting to lose its enthusiasm for peacekeeping. Peacekeepers had been unable to stop the fighting in the former Yugoslavia. <coughs> the humiliating Black Hawk Down incident in Mogadishu in October 1993 contributed to the United States withdrawing from Somalia and generally becoming more wary of peacekeeping. And a UN force heading towards Haiti in October 1993 turned away when faced with possible opposition. In July 1993, the government agreed to support mine clearance training in Cambodia, along with other training activities. But reflecting the changing mood, in the same month Australia announced the withdrawal of its deminers from Pakistan. In November 1993, <coughs> Australia signalled that it would be withdrawing from Western Sahara and would not immediately replace its frigates in the Red Sea. But Australia hadn't completely given up on peacekeeping. In December 1993, Australia agreed to provide 16 Australian Federal Police, AFP officers and officials from the Australian Electoral Commission and other government departments to assist with elections in Mozambique. In March 1994, the government agreed to maintain that commitment in Somalia until November 1994. And in July 1994, the government decided to send four engineer mine clearance trainers to Mozambique. Most importantly, also in July, the government decided to deploy a medical contingent with protection and support elements, about 300 people, to Rwanda. The government's first reaction was not to become involved but it was eventually persuaded by the need to do something to help prevent or at least alleviate further tragedy in Rwanda. The first Australian contingent deployed in August 1994, but it was the second contingent that experienced the horror of the Cabello massacre in April 1995. The force in Rwanda faced similar challenges to those experienced in Somalia. The deployment highlighted the continuing issue of how best to command medical units deployed overseas. And as with Somalia, the Rwanda commitment provided valuable experience for the senior officers. For more junior military personnel, it was a formative experience, although some developed post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, as a result of the tragedies they had witnessed. For the ADF, that too was a learning experience as it grappled with how to cope with further cases of PTSD following its extensive operations in Afghanistan after 2001. Following Rwanda, there was a reduction in UN peacekeeping and a similar reduction in Australia's commitment. When in August 1995, Defence Minister Ray was asked whether there were any circumstances 
in which Australia might contribute to a UN operation in Bosnia. He replied, oh yes, over my dead body. <laughs> By then, Australians had already served in Haiti. In September 1984, the government approved the deployment of 25 AFP officers to Haiti for almost five months as part of a multinational force. This came after the deployment of Australian police to Cambodia in 1989 through to 1993, to Somalia in 1993 to 95, and to Mozambique, 32 members, during 1994 and in addition to that long-running commitment in Cyprus. The deployments to Haiti and Mozambique provided a formative experience for many AFP officers who later served elsewhere. The missions in Somalia and Rwanda, and to a lesser extent in Mozambique, brought many lessons to the fore. There was a need to improve pre-deployment training, especially to include language proficiency and cultural awareness. There were more weakness, major weaknesses in the ADF's ability to provide logistic support to deployed forces and shortcomings in their equipment. ADF personnel needed to learn how to work with foreign forces. More attention needed to be given to providing optimum working conditions for deployed troops and support for families at home. Some of these lessons were heeded, some were not. It was easy to write off Somalia as a failed peacekeeping mission. Initially, however, UNITAF halted much of the violence and enabled the delivery of humanitarian supplies. In that sense, it was a success. But UNISOM could not achieve a lasting peace in Somalia unless all sides of the conflict were willing to work towards it. This proved not to be the case. The United Nations failed to prevent the genocide in Rwanda. And the name Rwanda became a byword for failure by the United Nations, the United States, and more broadly, the international community. But for all its faults, Unimir II, after the genocide, was able to bring some stability to Rwanda and thus enable it to start to recover from the trauma of the Civil War. The Australian contingent played an important role in this. The conclusion of the Australian mission in Rwanda in August 1995 was not by any means the end of Australian peacekeeping. But it was the end of the phase when Australia deployed moderately sized forces across the world to places remote from Australia under the auspices of the United Nations. By the end of 1995, Australia still had commitments in UNSO, Cyprus, UNSCOM and the Mozambique. Trainers were in Cambodia under bilateral agreements and there was the MFO in Sinai. In all, by that time, there were just under 80 Australians deployed in seven missions. A further high point in Australian peacekeeping would come in 1999 with the deployment of some 5,500 ADF members to East Timor as part of the international force in East Timor. And by that time, Australia was involved in peacekeeping missions in Bougainville and would soon be involved in the regional assistance mission in, in, the, in the Solomon Islands. But Australia would not again deploy ADF members to new UN missions outside the region until 2001, when it sent small numbers of observers uh, to Eritrea and trainers and advisors to Sierra Leone. These latter two missions were undertaken broadly for the uh, uh, were undertaken essentially for reasons of supporting uh, the Alliance. If the regional missions in Bougainville, East Timor and the Solomon Islands are included, the 15 years between 1988 and 2003 had indeed been the golden age of Australian peacekeeping. We're unlikely to see that level of involvement again. The 59 or so ADF members currently on peacekeeping operations in the Middle East and South Sudan are a far cry from the figure of more than 1,700 ADF and police on peacekeeping missions 24 years ago in May 1993. Thanks very much.
Thank you, Dr. Horner, for giving us such a fascinating insight into the role Australia's played in UN peacekeeping missions and is still continuing to do so um, in the troubled areas of the world. Um, would you help me thank Dr. Horner? <laughs> we will now open for questions and general discussion. And could you please preface your remarks by stating your name, your organisation, and to whom your question or comment is addressed? Dr. Horner and Dr. Hongdi, if you would return. And I must congratulate uh, I must congratulate Dr. Horner for carrying on regardless when we had our little computer glitch there. Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> well, we'll just get, just get the question. We have a question to see, who, see who's going to give it. We're waiting for uh, microphones okay. as well. Right, um, we have a question from the lady in the front there. Nola Hennessy from Serenity. Could you speak up, please? We can't hear you. Nola Hennessy from Serenidad Consulting. My question immediately after Dr. Horner spoke was why the reduction in peacekeeping and um, associated forces, for want of a better expression, what policy changes might have occurred that caused that downgrade in numbers? I assume from that that you're referring to the, the, to the reduction by Australia rather than the reduction uh, sort of internationally? Uh, the, 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 uh, to be very fair to the, um, uh, uh, the Liberal government that came to power in 1996, they did not initially change any policy uh, uh, concerning Australian peacekeeping. Uh, and in fact, uh, I could have mentioned this, but obviously not the time. There were a couple of, uh, I've got to say, rather wacky peacekeeping missions that, that developed in uh, the United Nations tried to raise in 1996-1997 that Australia very wisely decided not to take, take part in. And no other country in the world did either because that's not well put together. So Australia was still well, to, well uh, disposed towards peacekeeping missions. But internationally, uh, the, the United Nations uh, raised far fewer missions in that period. I've talked about the, uh, uh, the problems that had appeared in Rwanda uh, in, in the former Yugoslavia. So there, there were not the same number of missions to go to. But very soon Australia found itself um, uh, facing problems in the region close to home. So we had uh, 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 an Australian peacekeeping mission that started in Bougainville in 1997 and went through to uh, about 2002. And then we had the very large peacekeeping mission that went into East Timor in 1999. And then we had the regional assistance mission in the Solomons in 2003. Uh, so uh, we were still still into peacekeeping, but it was closer to home. But there's a, there are, there, then, of course, there was the um, uh, the the way the world changed after the terrorist attacks in nine, of 9/11, and that meant Australia soon found itself involved in Afghanistan and Iraq, with heavy involvements in that in Afghanistan and Iraq. There wasn't really the scope for being involved in international peacekeeping in the same way, but. The United Nations had also changed and the United Nations was starting to look towards uh, peacekeeping being conducted by regional peacekeeping organisations rather than the UN. So, so for example, if there were problems to be dealt with in Africa, they would be best dealt with by some force raised by the, uh, one of the organisations within Africa itself. So there's a change internationally 
as well. Uh, nonetheless, uh, um, uh, there would have been some peacekeeping missions that Australia could have been involved in, but the government was, by the early part of the, uh, of, of the 2000 period, uh, closely, he heavily involved in, some, in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, I, I agree with everything David said, uh, naturally. But uh, it seems to me that in one sense, although we think of ourselves as great peacekeepers, Australia traditionally has not been a great, a very strong peacekeeping nation. And it's been, apart from the recent period where we've been heavily involved in our own region, as David said, it's only been the two periods when we have really been pushing to get involved. And it has been because of... Uh, ministers of external or foreign affairs who believed strongly in it. So the Evert and uh, Gareth Evan and Evans periods were the periods when Australia got really involved in trying to, and you know, Evert wanted to solve every problem in the world. And in a sense, Evans also, I think, saw Australia as having a, a role as a good international citizen anywhere. Uh, but those have actually been two quite exceptional periods. And over the 70 years of our involvement in peacekeeping, as David's graph showed, uh, Australia has not been a huge and committed peacekeeper. And you know, one might hope that we will you know, return to that in the future. Thank you. Um, uh, John Langmore. It's said that there are uh, variations in the degree of support for peacekeeping within the ADF. Uh, how would you characterise the attitude to peacekeeping during the golden age? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question because uh, it's rather curious to see the, the way different parts of the government uh, reacted. Uh, generally, uh, foreign affairs was keen on, on peacekeeping. Uh, the Department of Defence uh, was uh, very reluctant in many cases to be involved in peacekeeping because they would have that, that bigger policy uh, uh, view that um, the main purpose of, of defence is, uh, is the defence of Australia and therefore you're diverting from the defence of Australia. On the other hand, you'd find that the army, after initial uh, hesitation, was rather keen on peacekeeping because that gave the uh, opportunity to uh, uh, send troops overseas uh, allow them to uh, get experience, test out systems and so on. And in particular, I referred to the battalion going to Somalia. It's very interesting. The, um, uh, it was the army that was pushing for the battalion to go to Somalia because the, the infantry had felt many peacekeeping missions and they'd missed out and they wanted to have their chance. Uh, and as I mentioned in my presentation, the army felt that they got some good training experience uh, and I remember watching people um, on television when they went into Somalia uh, to see how they'd react, because the cameras were right there, to see how they would react uh, when they had a contact. And I was really pleased to see the way the troops uh, reacted. That is, they, they reacted just the way we would have reacted in Vietnam, well trained, and none of them had had any previous military, um, operational service. Uh, so great training. Um, the Air Force uh, um, uh, is not closely involved and their main role is to, to get people there and to get them back. Um, and the Navy, again, um, uh, after some initial hesitation, was rather keen to be involved in those uh, maritime interception operations uh, in the Middle East because that, again, gave them good good training, a good experience, work, working with the Americans and so on. So yes, different parts of the ADF and different parts of the government had different views about peacekeeping. Yes, over here. Hi, I'm uh, James Cox from Pacifica. Uh, thank you both for your presentations. Um, and I was listening to them, listening to this history um, and in some ways it sounded like a slightly dispiriting story from time to time. Things go wrong, conflicts re-emerge and so on. But uh, the question that came to my mind, which you touched on, was what does success actually look like for us? Um, and thinking to the role of the conf of this, or the theme of this conference, you know, what is Australia's role in peace and security in the future, in peace making, peace building, peacekeeping? What, is, what does success look like? 
because th there is success even in some of these stories of failure. Who would you like to ask? Um, it's, probably, it's probably more for David, um, but both may have a comment. Yes, you, you may refer to what does success look like for us? But of course that begs the question, uh, uh, because it's really uh, what is the, what the, whether, this, whether the mission has been successful in bringing peace to the country that we're going to. We don't go there for success for us, we go there for success for the mission. Now in some cases there is a strong overlap between, between the two. It was very much in Australia's national interest that there should be peace in Cambodia. Uh, big, a big picture strategic interest for us. But of course it's also very good for the people of Cambodia if there's peace in, Cam in Cambodia. Uh, now this, the, the, uh, the, the picture is, uh, is patchy over the years. Um, you might say that the, the, uh, um, the mission in Kashmir, to which we sent troops for, uh, and uh, some aircraft for, for many, many years, has been a great, a great failure. Yeah, the problem hasn't been resolved. On the other hand, you might say it's a great success because it's, uh, in the main, prevented conflict uh, between the two, although there have been a few, a few nasty wars uh, during that, that period. You might say similarly that UNSO in the Middle East has been a great failure. Similarly, you might say, well, yes, it might have kept the dampener on, on some, of, some of the wars. Uh, as far as the Australians are, are concerned, most of the peacekeepers that I have spoken to have come back with, uh, with, with, with a mixture of thoughts. Some have been very proud of what they have done. Uh, I feel they really have achieved something of, of great importance in helping to maintain peace in, in, in certain areas. Others have come back rather dispirited about the whole affair. Uh, uh, for example, if you've come back from Somalia and you look at what's going on, you say, well, what did we achieve there? And I've got to say that quite a few peacekeepers have come back with uh, bad feelings about, uh, about, about what they see as the the poor administration of the United Nations, uh, or, or the lack of support that's provided in that in that in that way, uh, but uh, so there are, there are mixed there are mixed feelings about it all. Uh, um, but in the main, uh, most people would say that the countries where these peacekeeping missions have gone have been much better off for it uh, than had it had it not happened. And in that sense, the peacekeepers have got a lot to, lot to be very proud about. Can I just comment a little yes. on that? I, in my book, Other People's Wars, I suggested that uh, often what peacekeepers do is, is not to solve the overall problem, because sometimes the overall problem is really intractable, or, and sometimes it's hard to define what to solving it would be. But peacekeepers, what they do do is in a, a myriad interactions with local people, they often make individual lives better. So I think they're making things better than they would have been if they hadn't been there, but that is different from solving the whole problem. Uh, and th it is limited what one can achieve. Uh, I've talked to a lot of people who were in Rhodesia in 1979 to 80, who, and their job was to help uh, uh, demobilise the patriotic front guerrillas, get them into camps and make it possible for elections to happen. And they did that astoundingly successfully. It was a terribly thought out mission, hugely dangerous, but it actually went off really well. Elections were held without exception, I think. The people I talked to said, well, it's really sad what's happened in Zimbabwe since then. But that is not the the fault of the peacekeepers. They did what they needed to do, which was to allow a democratically elected government to take place and uh, to uh, get into existence. And after that, it's up to the Zimbabweans what happens. And you know, one of the problems with thinking we will solve everything is that it does tend to lead you into thinking we should go and change the society into uh, you know our model of society. And uh, peacekeeping, I think, always needs to have a more limited set of objectives than that to uh, stop actual violence and to set up a set of conditions as far as possible for the local people to you know, make whatever changes they want in the future. So I think you, know, you rarely have a, a mission which you can say is completely successful or completely a failure. I mean, in Somalia, Australia, the battalion in Baidoa did tremendous things in allowing the distribution of humanitarian aid. We were actually very successful in Somalia, however badly things went afterwards. So, yeah, it's, it's always going to be a complex business, I think, measuring success and failure, and perhaps it's a dangerous question to get into. Thank you for that. 
Could we have the gentleman here? Could you identify yourself, please? Uh, Nicholas Raphael, uh, Presswood Leosba. Um, the question I had to ask uh, was Dr. Mundi. Um, as um, the, the style of warfare that is prevalent today has moved away from... Um, as um, the style of warfare that is pre prevalent today has moved away from conventional means of warfare between recognised nation states towards a more decentralised guerrilla um, style of warfare, what place does peacekeeping have in that new environment that we see today um, that is currently evolving? And what changes, if any, uh, should take place to the peacekeeping format uh, to ensure the success of peacekeeping in this new um, and challenging environment? Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, I think peacekeeping is inherently highly flexible, and you know, I, I tried to say that a lot of the decisions that were being made in Indonesia were being made by the people on the ground who could see the problems and, and work out, in a sense, what was needed. And I've talked to lots of Australian peacekeepers, and I think that what they do bring to it is that sort of sense of personal initiative, and so they're approaching the problems intelligently. So. In those sort of fluid and ambiguous situations, that is the best you can do, I think. Uh, in the 90s, people kept talking about mandates. And it, I mean, the problem with mandates for peacekeeping operations, for UN ones at least, is it's, you know, a mandate is what is in a, a UN Security Council resolution, which has been thrashed out uh, as a, you know, in a, a f you know, a, in what Australian uh, diplomats sometimes call, you know, quite a Byzantine setting where people are, A, trying to you know, arrive at some compromise solution and you know, to what it, all the members of, at least all the members of the P5 on the Security Council can sign up to. And B, they're often working with limited knowledge and without, you know, you, uh, you don't want a resolution which is, is a book length. So I think in the end, a lot of it has to depend on giving as much autonomy to the peacekeepers as possible. Uh, these are, you know, generally, uh, it's, you know, you can't generalise, but you know, generally people of goodwill and you know, military good sense, and I think they need to be given a fair bit of autonomy to work out how what is going to be the best approach on the ground. Uh, beyond that, um, what the UN cannot afford to do, I think, is get involved in fighting wars. And one of the problems with Chapter Seven is that it is basically an invitation to fight wars. Uh, you know, it's couched in UN-style language, but uh, it means you can go and fight wars. That is always, I think, going to be a disastrous uh, outcome. It, uh, you know, the c case which is most, well, there are only two clear-cut cases where it's happened. In Kuwait, it wasn't so bad, but in Korea, the outcome was completely tragic, you know, which, with literally millions of people <coughs> losing their lives for almost no change in the overall you know, situation. So uh, peacekeeping has to always remember that the peacekeepers, at least, should be using the minimum level of force possible. Uh, it should be much more about uh, negotiation, about talking to people, about gathering intelligence or you know, information, as the UN likes to call it, and uh, just trying to um, build social structures which will help people. Having talked to some of the police who operated in East Timor after, you know, after the initial period of Interfet, you know, they were doing things like you know, trying to organise local employment, trying to you know, control traffic a bit. They were trying to do little things to help make it possible for the society to get back on its feet. And I think often that's the sort of thing which is really required rather than, in a sense, the big picture stuff. Unfortunately, we've been given the wind up sign, so I'm um, sorry we can't have any other um, questions. But I'd like to thank you both and um, thank you for engaging with us and um, giving us a little bit of an insight in what happens out there in the field. And um, I love the photographs, I must say, that um, they were very special, showing us just exactly what goes on in, in some of these missions. So I would like you all to thank uh, Dr Londi and Dr Horner once more. Thank you. Thank you.